Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, preparing this talk has brought back many memories from long ago, over 50 years ago in some instances. I've tried to present memories, uh, not just of learning ideas, but memories of the uh, individual physical human beings who propounded the ideas. Human beings, each with a definite physical appearance and present in definite physical surroundings. However imperfectly, it's such remembrances that I want to convey to you. Most of the memories are very pleasant, but some of them are not. Either way, I hope you'll find them of interest. It's possible that you may already have heard some of what I, ha I will say from Professor Rako. Uh, who was there with me uh, when most of the events I will recount took place. I'm afraid that some duplication between us may simply be unavoidable. I need to say a few words about myself prior to meeting Mises, Rothbard, or Rand. By the age of 15, I already believed in individual rights and laissez-faire capitalism and knew that knowledge of economic theory was essential to the defense of both. And on the basis of that understanding, I was reading Mises's Socialism for Intellectual Ammunition. I had first become aware of Mises and how important it was to read him about a year and a half earlier when I read his essay, Lord Keynes and Say's Law, in the second issue of The Freeman, which was then a great magazine under the editorial guidance of Henry Hazlitt. I date my intellectual adulthood from the reading of socialism, which gave me the philosophy of liberalism and the philosophy of utilitarianism. At the time, the year was 1952, I was a junior in the Bronx High School of Science in New York City. The school was the city's leading public high school and was permeated by all of the far-left ideas of the time, above all by Marxism in its social democratic variant. Not surprisingly, I was not a very popular student there, uh, either with the faculty or with the other students. There was such a mutual antagonism of ideas that I went through high school in something approaching a state of Cold War. <laughs> Sometime in March of 1952, I spoke at a mock political convention held in the assembly hall of the school's annex. I spoke for Senator Robert Taft, the right-wing Republican candidate of the time, who a few months later lost his party's nomination to Dwight Eisenhower. <coughs> Before the event began, a fellow student approached me to ask a question. I expected, as was so often the case, that his question would be an attempt to taunt me for my right-wing views, and so I was instinctively combative and decided that before he could deliver his expected jibe, I would strike first. I did so by immediately throwing my own question at him as he approached. What's on your small mind, I asked him. <laughs> His answer was somewhat surprising. He said that he just wanted to be, sure, to be sure that my arguments for Taft were well prepared. That student was Ralph Rako. <laughs> he was much thinner then than he is now. <laughs> and he had a lot more hair on his head than he does now. Ralph says that I too was thinner, but not nearly as much thinner as he was. <laughs> It didn't take me very long to learn how mistaken I'd been in the way I had greeted him. I quickly learned that it had been he who had pasted up a sticker for Taft that I had seen in one of the school stairwells and that he was actively working in the Taft campaign. We met after school and quickly became very good friends. Ralph brought me into the Taft campaign. We set up literature tables outside the main New York Public Library 
at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue and easily gathered crowds with whom we debated such economic issues as farm subsidies, tariffs, labor legislation, and the gold standard. Ralph had read Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, as had I, and Mises' Omnipotent Government and Bureaucracy, and was also an avid reader of the Freeman. We had so much in common that it seemed that either of us could take the other's place in the middle of a sentence in making the case for economic freedom. We both admired Mises profoundly and very much wanted to meet him. So we devised a plan as to how to do this. <laughs> we knew where Mises lived, 777 West End Avenue, which was the southwest corner of West End Avenue and 98th Street, if you're ever in New York City. His address had been published in the Freeman under some legal requirement. Our plan was to go to his apartment, ring his doorbell, and when he answered, tell him we were selling subscriptions to the Freeman. <laughs> hoping thereby to begin a conversation with him. <laughs> well, he answered the door. Uh, he was wearing a tuxedo, except for the jacket, obviously preparing to go to some formal event. We told him what we were selling, and he replied in a strong German accent, I have the Freeman, whereupon, whereupon he closed the door. <laughs> Needless to say, we were very disappointed. <laughs> Crushed would be a better word. That was sometime in 1952. Later in that year, uh, I only learned this uh, last night in part, uh, Ralph uh, uh, came to the attention of the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE, and obtained an invitation for the two of us to come up and visit their headquarters, which was located north of New York City. When we got there, we met Leonard Reed, the president of the foundation, and probably all of its key staff members. We naturally told them all of our admiration for Mises. Ivan Beerley, the vice president of the foundation, told us he would try to arrange a meeting for us with Mises. Well, Beerley came through, and thus Ralph and I finally got to meet Mises. The meeting took place on February 23, 1953, in Mises' office in his apartment. I know the date because it accompanied the autograph he wrote in my copy of Human Action. That autograph, by the way, like every other instance of his handwriting that I ever saw, was written in perfect script, something really admirable uh, just for its neatness and clarity. Mises' apartment was on the 12th floor. It was 12E to be exact. His office had a great view of the Hudson River and the New Jersey Palisades beyond. His desk chair, however, faced a wall of books on the opposite side of his office. I later learned that all of his bookshelves were two rows deep, so that there were actually twice as many books as met the eye. I want to give a brief physical description of Mises himself and later of Rothbard and Ayn Rand so that you'll have at least a rough idea of what they all looked like then. Mises was 71 years old at the time. Despite that, his face was still ruddy and had virtually no wrinkles. And I don't think it did even when he was 91, which was the last time I saw him. His hair was white. He had blue eyes and a silver white mustache. He was probably about 5 feet 6 or 5 feet 7 inches tall. And I would estimate his weight at about 150 pounds. There's a portrait of him right here around the corner that I hope you'll all stop and take a look at. Uh, that is a very, very good likeness of it. And it's that portrait, incidentally, was a gift uh, to Murray Rothbard from the Circle Bastiat in 1956 on the occasion of his obtaining his PhD. It was an enlargement of what was originally a 5 by 7 black and white photograph. I smoked at the time. Mises commented that he himself had smoked for many years and had greatly enjoyed it, but had had to give it up on the advice of his doctors. In our meeting, we asked Mises various questions. One concerned the national debt and whether it should be paid off. He replied that the national debt was not a major problem 
that if it simply were not increased, it would become less and less important as economic progress succeeded in enlarging the economic system. He supported his point by referring to the national debt of Great Britain after the Napoleonic Wars, which at the time seemed enormous, but later on seemed trifling. Another question elicited a response that the reason fee did not succeed in convincing many people was that it based its case for economic freedom on natural rights rather than on utilitarianism. The most important outcome of our meeting was that Mises invited Ralph and me to attend his graduate seminar at NYU. But he imposed a condition, knowing that we were both 16 years old at the time. The condition was <clears throat> that we agreed not to make noise. <clears throat> <laughs> you can be sure that we readily agreed. Soon thereafter, Ralph and I began attending Mises' seminar. I continued to attend it practically every week for a total of seven and a half years, from the spring semester of 1953 through the spring semester of 1960. I stopped attending when I got my first teaching job, which, re which required that I be elsewhere at the time the seminar met. The seminar, incidentally, always met on Thursday evenings from 7.25 to 9.10. In the spring of 1953 and the following academic year, 1953-54, the seminar met at 90 Trinity Place, which was then the site of New York University's Graduate School of Business Administration. The building was situated next door or almost next door to the American Stock Exchange and was diagonally across from Trinity Church and its cemetery. It was a block north of Wall Street and a block west of Broadway. It was very old and even lacked an elevator. It was demolished sometime after 1960. The seminar met on the first floor of the building in the main conference room. There was a very large conference table. Mises sat at the head of it on the side toward the room's entrance. If I remember correctly, well over a dozen people were able to sit around the table. Others sat in comfortable chairs arranged around the sides of the room. In the fall of 1954, the seminar was deprived of the use of the conference room, and its first meeting of that term took place in extremely cramped quarters of the building, possibly even in its basement. The room was extremely warm and uncomfortable. Fortunately, within a very short time, I think by the very next week, the seminar found new quarters that were far better than ever. It was moved to one of NYU's Washington Square facilities, specifically to the Gallatin House, located at 6 Washington Square North. This was the uh, building that at one time had been the British consulate in New York City. Out front, there are still the sculptures of two lions guarding the broad steps that lead up to the building's entrance. The steps are like those found in front of a, tri of a typical brownstone house, but somehow better looking and the building itself was, and I believe still is, red rather than brown. I hope if you're ever in New York, you make it a point to stop by and look at the, at the building. Here in what had originally probably been a large dining room located in the rear of the first floor, the seminar met until sometime after 1960, by which time NYU had constructed a new building at 100 Trinity Place, and the seminar moved there into what was essentially an ordinary classroom, but with a seminar table. The Washington Square location was several stories tall. Mises had a large office on the top floor. He would come down in a small elevator when the seminar was ready to begin. I recall the seminar table being made of a very rich-looking dark wood, possibly mahogany. It was about as large as the previous one had been, but here Mises would sit over on the right side of the table in the middle rather than one of the heads of the table as previously. The best way I can express what I felt whenever I saw Mises enter the seminar room is contained in a little story Murray Rothbard related to me sometime during this period. Murray told me that a friend of his working with the, was working with the uh, William Volcker Fund and was about Murray's age and that this friend had met Mises on his arrival at an airport. And in the course of exchanging welcoming greetings, Mises had told him uh, to call him Lou, short for Ludwig. The young man found this extremely difficult or even impossible to do. Murray explained why very simply. You can't call God Lou. 
<laughs> I understood and agreed completely. What I felt whenever I saw Mises, when I looked over at him seated just a few feet away, was that I was in the presence of one of the truly great men <clears throat> of all history. I want to describe who was in the seminar. Over a period of seven and a half years, it was not always the same people, though some of them did come for the whole time. First and foremost, there was Murray Rothbard, who had already been in attendance for some years prior to my and Ralph's arrival, and who I think continued regularly attending until 1958. Much more about Murray later, though early on I recall him once aptly describing the seminar as, quote, a Viennese-type seminar, a student can keep coming until either he dies or the professor dies. <laughs> In addition to Murray, there, was, uh, there were Hans and Mary Zenholtz. They attended until Hans left to teach at Grove City College, which I think was sometime in or after 1958. I remember a group of us being in Hans's home somewhere not very far from Fee, when his son Robert was about a year old, and Hans was talking about his translation of Bombavrik's Capital and Interest, which he described as being close to publication. Mises incidentally attached the greatest importance to this translation, uh, which was of Bombavrik's third edition, and I believe uh, he was the driving force behind it. He thought it very important that the translation of this considerably enlarged and improved edition take the place of the William Smart translation of the first edition. There were Percy Graves and Bettina Bean, who later married each other. Bettina subsequently compiled a two-volume bibliography of all of Mises' works. You can see it right out here uh, on one of the bookshelves. Uh, Percy later prepared a glossary for human action known as Mises Made Easier. Bettina and Percy were both especially close to Mises and to his wife, Margaret. Margaret, who in Vienna had been an actress and a translator of plays, occasionally attended the seminar. Israel Kurtzner was there for several years though I do not recall him speaking very much. Bill and Mary Peterson also attended. Bill was himself a professor at NYU. <clears throat> Other regular or frequent attendees were George Cother and Louis Spadaro. There was an accountant named Ronald Hertz, and I think there's a paving stone out front with his uh, name on it. Uh, there was a lawyer from Connecticut named Dearson, a doctor from New Jersey who was a naval <coughs> captain, and there was a restaurant owner from Brooklyn named Hodes who arranged occasional dinner meetings that were loosely affiliated with the seminar and were well attended. Lawrence Fertig, who wrote a weekly newspaper column on economic affairs for the World Telegram and Sun and who helped make it possible for Mises to teach at NYU, also attended from time to time, as did Philip Courtney, who was the president of Cody International, then an important perfume manufacturer. From around the fall of 1954 on, Bob Hessen, later a professor at Stanford University, became a regular member, as did Leonard Liggio, who is now president of the Mount Pelerin Society. Not much later, uh, so did Ronald Hamaway, who later became a professor of history at the University of Alberta. Hessen had been converted from socialism to capitalism by RACO in their years at Bronx Science. Hamaway, too, whom I had known since the ninth grade, had been a leftist, but began to change his mind one day before my eyes when the bureaucratic intricacies of registering for classes at Hunter College <laughs> <laughs> drove him to such despair that he spontaneously jammed his thumb on an ink pad in order to provide a fingerprint on his enrollment form. His conversion to libertarianism began in that moment. I, I, have to confess, I have to confess that I was egging him on, telling him that it was such bureaucracy that we were fighting, and that this was what it was all about. <laughs> Certainly one of the uh, very most important of all attendees at this seminar was Henry Hazlitt, who sat in fairly often when the seminar was located in Washington Square. He then lived at 25 Washington Square West, which was diagonally just across the square. In addition to turning out books and essays, Hazlitt wrote a weekly column uh, for Newsweek magazine called Business Tides. 
Regrettably, his association with the Freeman had ended in the spring of 1953, after which the Freeman was never the same. In this whole group, uh, Kurtzner and Zenholtz were the only actual NYU students. I did not become one until 1957 when I enrolled in the school's doctoral program. Murray obtained his doctorate from Columbia University and I attended Columbia College from 1953 to 1957. Around the time that I became an NYU student, Bob Anderson, one of Zenholtz's graduates from Grove City, came to NYU and joined the seminar. He later became a vice president of FEE. There were other NYU students, of course, but none I can think of who would be of any, of any interest to anyone here. The most notable, perhaps, was a Jesuit priest, Father McGinnis, uh, who very early on asked Mises if he believed in ontology and seemed somewhat surprised and glad when Mises answered that he did. I should also mention that one evening in 1957 or 1958, Ayn Rand attended and was warmly welcomed and introduced to everyone by Mises. Uh, I believe that Alan Greenspan was part of the group that came with her. This was the one and only time that he attended, to my knowledge. The topics discussed in the seminar varied from term to term. Epistemology was a frequent subject perhaps because Mises was working on his book, Theory and History. But money, inflation, credit expansion and the business cycle, monopoly, Marxism, socialism, interventionism, and capitalism were also major subjects. I've come across papers I wrote for the seminar on a number of these subjects. Papers were written in response to requests from Mises. In the course of an evening, he would identify a topic needing discussion for the following week and turn to a seminar member and ask him to write such a paper. I think that along with Murray, I became one of the two most frequent such requestees. Mises' requests were always honored. <clears throat> After I joined the seminar, I uncharacteristically kept quiet, not asking any questions for over a year and a half. My very first question concerned the discussion in human action dealing with Bismarck's Sozialpolitik. Mises had explained how labor and social legislation had raised costs of production in Germany and made it impossible for German manufacturers to compete either at home or abroad. He explained that in order to overcome this handicap, the German government then imposed high protective tariffs, which secured the domestic market from foreign competition and also deliberately promoted the formation of industrial cartels able to reap monopoly profits in the domestic market behind the tariff walls. He explained further that these monopoly profits were used to subsidize the dumping of German manufacturers in foreign markets, a policy that enabled Germany to secure the foreign exchange needed to pay for imports of vital food supplies and raw materials which could not be produced domestically. I was troubled by one aspect of the analysis. <clears throat> Namely, that it did not address the question of why these policies did not result either in mass unemployment or in sharply lower wages and uh, prices and wages in the part of the German economy that had not been cartelized. I thought that the only thing that could explain the avoidance of these consequences was an increase in the quantity of money in Germany that would enable people to pay higher prices for the same overall quantity of goods and services. Mises did not agree with this immediately, but he did agree with it the following week after he had thought about it more and said that it had in fact been necessary to increase the quantity of money. This was sometime in the fall of 1954. Uh, if you attend my session Thursday night, incidentally, you'll see that I'm still raising the same question, but in a different context. <coughs> In the seminar, Mises frequently, frequently stressed the importance of learning foreign languages. He himself knew French, Italian, and Spanish as well as English. And he had studied Latin and Greek as well when he was a student. You can see his tremendous erudition in the footnotes to socialism. And in a charming touch, probably reminiscent of the days before World War I, when several years later I turned in my MBA thesis to him, he insisted on inserting a Greek word somewhere in its text. <coughs> uh, 
he somehow must have believed that the total absence of Greek from a scholarly manuscript might subject it to the criticism of being insufficiently scholarly. (laughs) I cannot help but think it both very surprising and very amusing that he had not realized that his contemporary academics had more than enough to do just to understand English, let alone (laughs) be perturbed by the absence of Greek. Uh, In any case, I took Mises' stress on learning foreign languages to heart. And when I entered college in the fall of 1953, I threw myself into learning German with an eye toward being able to read his works and the works of other members of the Austrian school that had not yet been translated. For over an entire school year and most of a term, I memorized 50 to 100 German words a day. The declension of nouns in all cases, singular and plural, and the conjugation of verbs in every person, tense, and mood, active and passive. The result was that by the time of the Christmas vacation of 1954, with the encouragement of Murray Rothbard, I dared to undertake the translation of a section of Mises' Grundprobleme der Nationalökonomie, now known in English under the title Epistemological Problems of Economics. Mises agreed to approve my translating the rest of the book the following summer, 1955. Largely thanks to a very supportive letter from Murray, I got a grant from the William Volcker Fund to carry out the project. It was a grant for $1,200, a sum that uh, seems almost trivial today, but in 1955, with college credits only around $15 per unit, a newspaper five cents and a double feature movie 60 cents, it was a considerable sum of money. In any case, doing the translation and being paid so handsomely to do it was the greatest thing I could imagine doing at the time. And to this day, I consider the translation to be one of my major accomplishments. I worked relentlessly through the summer and handed in a completed typed manuscript to Mises on the first evening the seminar met in the fall of 1955. Mises already knew that I had completed the job and remarked that someday I would write books of my own. In similar vein, about two years later, he very generously inscribed my copy of his theory of history, quote, to George Reisman, the economist of the future, with all good wishes for the success of his work, end quote. Perhaps the greatest compliment I ever received from him was to be acknowledged, along with several others, in the forward to the third edition of Human Action, quote, for very valuable and helpful suggestions. I've mentioned Murray Rothbard a few times, and I now want to turn my attention to him in greater detail for a while. (coughs) Murray was 27 years old in the spring of 1953 when Ralph and I joined the seminar at the age of 16. I remember him as being about 5 feet 7 or 5 feet 8 inches tall, a little taller than Mises. I think he weighed about 150 pounds. He had a high forehead and slightly wiry brown hair. He wore glasses. His favorite outfit at that time was a brown suit. He usually wore a tie, but it was always a bow tie, never a regular tie. In the winter, he wore a camel's hair overcoat and a short brown brimmed hat. Murray was very friendly toward Ralph and me from the beginning. He got to know us, and we got to know him quite well. And within a year, the three of us had become very good friends. One of the things I remember from the early days is Murray asking me what I thought of the doctrine of states' rights. My instantaneous reply was, states have no rights. Murray liked that answer a lot. We both understood that what I meant was that only individuals have rights. After the seminar, we almost always went together to a nearby restaurant to have a late night bite to eat. I have to interject here that it was late night for me and Ralph, who had to be up early the next day for classes, but it was the equivalent of early afternoon for Murray, who customarily started working around midnight and continued until the early morning and then would sleep until the late afternoon. (laughs) An amusing incident in connection with Murray's hours was that a problem developed once with his bathroom sink. The flow of water couldn't be turned off. The water went on flowing literally for months because Murray and the repairman in his apartment building were unable to arrange a mutually agreeable time. (laughs) 
what we talked about after the seminar was not only the seminar itself, but also about any aspect of economics, and not only economics, but also politics, history, philosophy, and whatever else might interest us at the moment. And the conversation was almost always filled with a great deal of laughter. Murray and I came to talk not only on these occasions, but also very frequently and at considerable length on the phone. And the three of us soon began to meet on weekend evenings uh, to go to the movies. And soon we were meeting in Murray's living room, both after the movies and after the seminar. And incidentally, you know, someone was asking last night, what has happened to the size of the libertarian movement? For many years, I used to say, uh, it could have all fitted into Murray's living room. And, uh, and I say, uh, almost always, there was a great deal of laughter intermixed with the most serious discussions. I want to say that it was almost always extremely enjoyable to be in Murray's company. There were other things in my life at the time that might depress me sometimes, uh, such as not succeeding all that well with girls. <laughs> but meeting Murray would raise my spirits, and I was very much aware of this at the time. Murray lived at 201 West 88th Street, which is on the northeast corner of 88th Street and Broadway. His apartment was on the second floor, and his living room was directly above the building's lobby. If you ever pass by, you'll notice that his living room had a very distinctive window, unlike any of the others in the building. Murray was married. His wife's name was Joanne, Joey for short. She was always present when we met in Murray's apartment, and she usually contributed to the discussions. She and Murray had met at Columbia University when both were graduate students. She had a master's degree in mathematics. Murray's book, America's Great Depression, is dedicated, quote, to Joey, the indispensable framework. I mentioned Bob Hessen and Leonard Liggio as joining the seminar in the fall of 1954. They also joined many of our meetings, and at some point the five of us gave ourselves the name Circle Bastiat, after the great 19th century French libertarian economist Frederick Bastiat. Previously, in our high school days, Ralph and I and a few other students we knew had called ourselves the Cobden Club, after the great English free trader Richard Cobden. Ronald Hamaway later became a member of the Circle Bastiat, as did several others. My personal friendship with Murray became such that he once told me that he had never met anyone more like himself than me. In my copy of On Freedom and Free Enterprise, in which Murray has an essay toward a reconstruction of utility and welfare economics, he wrote his autograph, along with an inscription that was an incredible compliment to me. Quote, George, to the outstanding representative of the sixth Austrian generation. The first five generations, of course, being Menger, Bombabrik, Mises, Hayek, and Rothbard. This book was a collection of essays in honor of Mises on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his doctorate. February 20th, 1956. A copy of the book was distributed to each of the guests at the dinner commemorating the event, which was held at the University Club in New York City. I was privileged to attend. Murray and I did not always agree. We disagreed about the theory of imputation, which in case anyone may have forgotten, is the theory that holds that the value of products is attributed back to the factors of production that produce them. More importantly, we disagreed about aspects of the theory of profit and interest. Occasionally, Murray became impatient with me, but there was an element of humor even then. He jokingly referred to a problem I had raised as das Reismann problem in his best <laughs> German accent. <laughs> of course, many years later, our disagreements over matters such as the actions of the United States versus those of the Soviet Union would be vastly greater. I turn now uh, to Ayn Rand. Sometime in the late spring or early summer of 1954, at one of the Circle Bastiat's gatherings in Murray's living room, the name Ayn Rand came up. I don't remember in what context it came up or who mentioned it first, but Murray spoke at some length about her. I had previously never heard of her. He made her sound both eccentric and fascinating. He had met her and apparently had even read a portion of the manuscript of Atlas Shrugged, on which she had been working since 1946, I believe. 
For his part, Murray was working on his own magnum opus, Man, Economy, and State, which he completed while I knew him, but which was not published until 1960. Based on what they heard, everyone in the circle Bastiat became very eager to meet Ayn Rand, something which Murray had indicated he was capable of arranging. Everyone, that is, except Murray. Murray was extremely reluctant to actually arrange the meeting. His voice seemed to project a profound exhaustion at the prospect. <laughs> Nevertheless, the rest of us prevailed, and Murray reluctantly agreed to try to arrange a meeting between Ayn Rand and the Circle Bastia. <clears throat> the meeting was set for Saturday evening, July 10th, in Ayn Rand's apartment, which was then at 36 East 36th Street near Madison Avenue. That meeting resulted in a follow-up meeting the very next Saturday night. Both meetings lasted until about 5 a.m. the next morning. Ayn Rand was then 49 years old. I estimate her height to have been about 5 feet 5 inches and her weight at about 135 pounds. Her face was framed by straight dark hair. Her best facial feature was her large brown eyes. She spoke with a fairly heavy Russian accent. Uh, at the two meetings, her husband, Frank O'Connor, was present, as was Leonard Peikoff. Frank O'Connor, by the way, was a man of considerable talent as an artist, in my judgment. I greatly admired some of his paintings. There were also others present whom I don't remember. Uh, Nathaniel Brandon and his wife were then away in Canada. When I entered Ayn Rand's apartment, I did so with three firmly held, explicit intellectual values. First and foremost, liberalism, as expanded by Mises. Second, utilitarianism, as also expanded by Mises. And third, McCarthyism. After those meetings, my confidence in utilitarianism, in utilitarianism was badly shaken and never recovered. Most of the discussion on those two nights was between myself and Ayn Rand. Murray played the role of an amused spectator. What amused him was seeing me go through the same kind of experience he had previously gone through. I had begun with what I thought was the almost self-evident proposition that values, at least fundamental values, were arbitrary and subjective and had to be taken as a, quote, ultimate given, in the words of Mises. That argument was possible only about means, but not about ultimate ends. I couldn't believe that Ayn Rand didn't accept this. To the contrary, she claimed that the foundation of all values is not anything arbitrary or subjective, but rather the objective fact of one's life and its requirements for action in the face of the fundamental alternative of life and death. At first I thought she must simply be ignorant, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not budge her. She had an answer and an explanation for everything, even including a preference for vanilla ice cream over chocolate ice cream, or, <laughs> <laughs> or blondes over brunettes. More than that, she was succeeding in repeatedly driving me to have to support positions that I didn't want to support in order to defend utilitarianism. While I do not remember the precise examples she used at the time, I think that the following will indicate the nature of the predicament she put me in. If all ultimate ends are in fact arbitrary and subjective, then they are all equally valid. Thus, the satisfaction a socialist dictator derives from the murder of his victims, or the pleasure another monster derives from the torture and murder of children, are just as valid as ultimate ends as the satisfaction a physician derives from saving lives or a scientist derives from the discovery of truth or a businessman derives from the profit he makes on the introduction of a great new product. And along the same lines, modern Western civilization is of no greater objective value than the culture of a primitive jungle tribe. The concept of economic progress is arbitrary and subjective. Capitalism is of no greater objective value than socialism. Obviously, I did not want to accept any such propositions, but also saw no way to avoid accepting them if I was to support the proposition that ultimate ends are arbitrary and subjective. Adding to the impression made by the power of the logic of Ayn Rand's arguments was the sheer force of her personality. 
I think the experience can perhaps best be described as comparable to being pre in the presence of the voice of judgment on Judgment Day. <laughs> a key moment was reached when she asked me, quote, do you believe that emotions are an irreducible primary, end quote. In fact, that was exactly what I believed. Not by any means in every instance, but in those instances in which ultimate ends were at stake. But by that time, I had become frightened of her, then driving me into some other position I did not want to take. <laughs> and so I did not allow myself to clearly recognize what I really believed. I evaded the knowledge in order to avoid being made to go once more where I didn't want to go. The joke, of course, was on me, because in denying what I actually believed, I was already in a much worse place than any into which I might have been driven. Perhaps this will serve as a further indication of the kind of thing I was afraid of. At some earlier point in the discussion, I don't know in response to what, I had expressed the opinion that in order for motion to be possible, absolutely empty space, a void, must exist. I thought that this followed from the fact that two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Ayn Rand's response was that my statement was, quote, worse than anything a communist could have said. <laughs> <laughs> that may sound crazy, but I already knew that she could probably come up with some kind of strong case for it. In her view, as I learned several years later, what I was asserting in that proposition was the existence of non-existence, a proposition that, in her view, was not only utterly self-contradictory, but in contradiction of the base of all knowledge, whose starting point is, existence exists. I have a copy of Ayn Rand's book, Anthem, which I had hastily read uh, between our first and second meetings. She generously inscribed it sometime on Sunday morning, July 18, 1954. Her inscription reads, quote, to George Reisman, calling your attention to the fact that the first three sentences in chapter 11, she's referring to Anthem, are inseparable and that you can't have any one without the others. Cordially, Ayn Rand. Those three sentences are, I am, I think, I will. As I read them now, I think I understand what she meant. My wife asked me uh, to think about what I felt after meeting Ayn Rand. I think the answer is summed up in the expression, I didn't know what hit me. <laughs> My experience with Ayn Rand had not been pleasant, and so no subsequent meeting took place for over three years. Nevertheless, I certainly did not forget those first two meetings, and the experience festered in me. I eventually began to think it necessary, after all, that some kind of objective foundation exists for values, lest one must stand helpless in the face of truly monstrous values with nothing to say in opposition. I thought repeatedly about what little I understood of her views. Interestingly, in this period, Murray was more sympathetic to Ayn Rand's views than I was. I remember an exchange between him and Mises in the seminar one night. Murray argued that there had to be reasons for value judgments, that, for example, it was not sufficient to say simply that one didn't like a movie and leave it at that. He argued that there was more to it, uh, such as the direction was poor, the acting was poor, or whatever. Mises replied that all that this meant was shifting the issue to the judgments about the direction or acting or whatever. At that level, the value judgment was still subjective, not objective. Uh, I then fully agreed. Of course, matters could have been shifted further back, but still the subjective element would ultimately have, have been decisive, I thought. In the second of our two meetings with Ayn Rand back in that period, uh, I had extended an invitation to her to attend a farewell dinner for Roy Cohn, who was then the departing chief aide to Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, the man after whom McCarthyism was named. McCarthy himself would be at the dinner as its most important and prominent guest. I was scheduled to speak at the event as the representative of a student organization that Ralph referred to last night. When I had told one of the event's organizers whom I knew that I had met Ayn Rand and would be meeting her again, she asked me to extend the invitation. 
Ayn Rand declined the invitation on the grounds that for her to get involved as she would need to, she would have to drop her present project, which of course was the writing of Atlas Shrugged, and do for McCarthy and Cohn what the famous French novelist Emile Zola had done for Dreyfus. I had some idea of Zola's stature at the time and probably experienced the comparison of herself to Zola as unjustified, if not simply outrageous. After I came to appreciate the nature of Ayn Rand's accomplishments, a comparison to Zola would seem several orders of magnitude too modest. The speech I referred to that, was scheduled, that, that I was scheduled to give at the dinner for Roy Cohn was written in its entirety by Murray. It was recorded at the time I gave it. And since, on, since it's only a few minutes long, I'm going to play it for you. It was a high point in my relationship with Murray. Uh, the speech earned some comment in Time magazine and in newspapers. I think it shows that among his many other talents, Murray could be a really excellent speechwriter capable of bringing a crowd to its feet in enthusiasm for what he wrote. So here's the speech uh, just as he wrote it and just as I delivered it uh, at the time.
I want to pray for Lord Cole that he could appreciate this because he's used to running and even instigating runaway grand juries. <laughs> and that the doctor we said, I took a mouth of pain. So, <laughs> well, I've told you uh, many of my remembrances of uh, Mises and his seminar and of Murray and the Circle Bastiat and of my first meetings with Ayn Rand in 1954. I want to jump ahead now to 1957, the year of publication of Atlas Shrugged. The Circle Bastiat was in full swing. Murray had gotten his doctorate from Columbia the year before and was now free to work without distraction on completing Man, Economy, and State. Mises expressed anger to me at Columbia for having needlessly delayed Murray's degree for several years. He said uh, that Murray was the best student they had had in many years and in essence that it was outrageous of them to have so delayed him. For my part, I graduated from Columbia College in June and began working on my PhD under Mises the very next month, enrolling in 10 points worth of graduate summer session courses at NYU. I had been awarded the William Volcker Fellowship in Political <coughs> Economy, uh, succeeding Israel Kurtzner in that honor. Bob Hessen and Ralph Rako were being tutored in philosophy by Leonard Peikoff around this time. Peikoff was close to Ayn Rand and was then working toward his doctorate in philosophy. He later inherited Ayn Rand's estate. Bob Hessen also had a part-time and then a summer job at the bookstore of one of New York's major airports and had gained some substantial knowledge about the book business. In late August or early September, he arranged for the pre-publication purchase of about 10 copies of Atlas Shrugged, which we were all eagerly awaiting. I can still remember Bob taking the copies out of the trunk of his car and collecting money from several of us. I think Ralph was at my side and Leonard Liggio as well. And I'm pretty sure we took an extra copy to deliver to Murray since it was too early for him to have been there personally. We all began reading Atlas almost immediately. In fact, apart from time off for such necessary activities as eating and sleeping, I did nothing but read Atlas Shrugged for four solid days. I found the book irresistibly compelling. As far as I was concerned, the expression page-turner could have been invented just for it. I've always thought of it as being, among other things, the most exciting plot novel ever written. Actually, there was one thing I did have time for while I was reading Atlas, and that was talking about it on the phone with Murray. Because I had started reading it a day earlier than he, I was about 200 pages ahead of him in the book. <laughs> As Murray later described it, roughly every 200 pages, the book seemed to reach a higher level of intensity. From about page 800 on, however, I began to feel that it was getting too intense. Looking back, what I now think was operative was my experiencing once again what I previously alluded to as the voice of judgment on Judgment Day. Starting around page 800, the full force of Ayn Rand's personality in the flesh was coming out of the pages of Atlas Shrugged. Murray did not initially understand my reaction. He was, after all, a day behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but the next day, after he had reached the same point, his reaction turned out to be the very same as mine had been. Atlas, we, we agreed, was an absolutely fantastic book but we couldn't be sure if we fully liked it. But very quickly, as the content of the book sank in on us more, any res reservations we had had fell away and our enthusiasm became total. Not long after, Murray wrote an extremely eloquent letter to Ayn Rand, lavishly praising her and Atlas Shrugged. If I remember correctly, part of his letter compared her to the light of the sun, which one cannot approach too closely for fear of being blinded. I did not write a letter, but I remember seriously believing and possibly relating to Ayn Rand herself somewhat later that the power of Atlas Shrugged was so great that I expected it to convert the whole country in about six weeks. <laughs> I thought that everyone who read it would either be converted by the power of its arguments or suffer a mental breakdown in the attempt to evade them. 
I actually contemplated the prospect of being technologically unemployed as an economist as the result of this one novel rendering any additional economics and economic analysis simply superfluous in the battle to determine public opinion. (laughs) I certainly was naive. Uh, The world is full of people who are impervious to bricks falling on their heads (laughs) or at least to intellectual bombs exploding around them. At the age of 20, I couldn't imagine such blindness. Even today, I still have some difficulty believing it when I see it, and I certainly do see it. Mises' reaction to, to Atlas Shrugged was also very positive, though not at all unrealistically so. He was very enthusiastic, but within a few months of publication, it had already sold 140,000 copies. He thought that the book would make an important difference and told me that he couldn't understand how anyone could read it and still vote for the left. In January of 1958, Mises wrote Ayn Rand a letter in which he said, quote, but Atlas Shrugged is not merely a novel. It is also, or may I say, first of all, a cogent analysis of the evils that plague our society, a substantiated rejection of the ideology of our self-styled intellectuals, and a pitiless unmasking of the insincerity of the policies adopted by governments and political parties. It is a devastating exposure of the moral cannibals, the gigolos of science, and of the academic prattle of the makers of the anti-industrial revolution. You have the courage to tell the masses what no politician told them. You are inferior, and all the improvements in your conditions which you simply take for granted, you owe to the effort of men who are better than you." End quote. <laughs> In January of 1958, Nathaniel Brandon began delivering a series of 20 public lectures on the philosophy of Ayn Rand. The word objectivism had not yet been introduced as the name of her philosophy. Brandon introduced it in the course of this lecture series. Atlas Shrugged had been dedicated to Brandon along with Ayn Rand's husband, Frank O'Connor. Though he was then just 27 years old, Ayn Rand referred to him as her intellectual heir. Brandon's first series of lectures were delivered at the Sheraton Russell Hotel on Park Avenue and 37th Street, a little more than a block from Ayn Rand's apartment. Ayn Rand was always present and very actively participated in the lengthy question periods that followed the lectures. There were 28 students in attendance in that first series. Within a few years, it would grow to hundreds and then thousands scattered in various locations across the country, listening to the lectures on tape. Among the students at that first series were Murray, Ralph, and myself, and other members of the Circle Bastiat. I've already indicated the forcefulness of Ayn Rand's personality, which obviously could be abrasive at times. Unfortunately, the personalities of her leading followers, with much less to offer in the way of knowledge and intellectual power than she, were also sometimes unpleasant to deal with. Several of her leading followers, and I'm sorry to say, she herself, became sources of amusement within the Circle Bastiat. One evening when we gathered at Murray's apartment, uh, someone, probably Murray, brought out a tape recorder. In 1958, a tape recorder was still something of a novelty. This one was a bulky reel-to-reel model. I don't think cassette recorders even existed at the time. We all began kidding around with the tape recorder. Uh, imitating some of the dialogue we had heard in some of the many World War II movies we had seen. Thus, Ronald Hamaway, I think, was being prepped by British intelligence prior to being dropped behind enemy lines in occupied France in the cover story he would give if he were stopped by a German patrol, prepped down to the location of the cemetery where his mother was supposedly buried. (laughs) I think he fell out of character and switched to something else. Anyway, I was dissatisfied with whatever he was doing and forcibly yanked the microphone away from him. I still remember the grunt he made when I did so. Using the line that started John Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, I coldly announced, Mr. Thompson's time is up. (laughs) Then we were all off and running. I did an imitation of Nathaniel Brandon saying his standard opening lines at the beginning of each of his lectures. Ralph soon joined in with an imitation of Ayn Rand talking to Murray, asking him if he understood some point or other, 
and then changing to a tone that seemed to threaten Murray's life. If you think. <laughs> <laughs> we all had a hilarious time that night. The aftermath, unfortunately, was not funny. Long after, uh, not long after our tape recording session, when I walked into Brandon's apartment one day, I was greeted with the comment, I understand that my voice is a source of amusement to you. He had learned about the taping from a young woman to whom Bob Hessen had related the story on a date. Hessen had been present at the taping session. I was greatly embarrassed and felt very bad for what I had done. At the time, I greatly admired Brandon and was becoming somewhat friendly with him. I decided that it was wrong to make fun of people one professes to admire, and so I apologized to him. Murray and Ralph did not see any need to apologize. Uh, Brandon asked Murray for the tape. I urged him to give it to him. Murray refused. There were other things going on between Murray and Brandon and Ayn Rand at the same time, which were starting to create some friction between them. In this period, uh, Murray once told me that he could get along fine with Ayn Rand if only they lived at opposite ends of the country. <laughs> Perhaps the main issue, which I was only marginally aware of at the time, was that Murray's wife, Joey, was a practicing Christian, while atheism was a leading tenet of objectivism. Murray himself was an atheist, as incidentally was Mises. Some years later, I once heard Ayn Rand say that it might be possible for an objectivist to fall in love with a Marxist, but she didn't see how the relationship could last. Presumably, she had the same attitude toward love between an objectivist and someone committed to religious faith, namely that it was at least possible and presumably should be respected as such. I knew that Joey's religion was a source of some discomfort in Murray's relationship with objectivism, but I saw it at the time as only a very minor matter. Whatever the underlying reasons, the aftermath of the taping session was that Murray and Ralph on the one side and myself on the other, began to be on a course of separation. For a little while, it was almost imperceptible, a comparable perhaps to the appearance of a narrow river in what up to then had been a solid landmass. But very soon, sometime in July of 1958, that river would suddenly widen into an ocean. The precipitating factor was a paper Murray had written, I believe for inclusion, in a symposium at Emory University in Atlanta. The paper called The Mantle of Science was later published in a book titled Scientism and Values. It's an excellent paper and is available on the internet. The problem was that the paper contained some passages that Rand and Brandon and I and Bob Hessen too believed called for citations to Miss Rand and to Brandon's wife, Barbara. I was and am convinced that as a minimum, Murray had learned the points in question from them and should have acknowledged them. I did not think that his failure to do so was a crime. In fact, I thought it was understandable and even forgivable. Professor Roderick Long, who is a member of this faculty, wrote an article that appeared on the Mises Org website last February on the occasion of Ayn Rand's 100th birthday. In it, he wrote that, quote, the number of academic philosophers who will privately admit having been decisively influenced by Ayn Rand is far greater than the number who can be found citing her in print, end quote. That's today. If today Ayn Rand is still something of an intellectual hot potato, back in 1958, she was intellectual plutonium, <laughs> something that hardly anyone would dare to touch or at least admit in print to touching. I can't help but think that the controversy surrounding Ayn Rand was a major consideration in Murray's mind and that he just didn't want to be identified with her in a scholarly publication. At that time, and in previous years, Murray was very cautious about what he put his name on. This didn't mean that he was afraid to express his views, but when he thought the views he expressed might be harmful to his career, he expressed them under a pseudonym. The name Aubrey Herbert, I think, was his favorite pseudonym. Murray's cautiousness collided with Ayn Rand's value scale. In Ayn Rand's value scale, no value in other people ranked higher than their personal loyalty to her. Above all, their willingness to stand by her side in the face of the hostility and abuse heaped upon her for her ideas. Seen in this light, Murray's behavior had to be intolerable for her, a major betrayal. Murray had a very good idea of where I stood on the matter. 
and one night in July, <clears throat> he and I met in his apartment to discuss it. Several others were present as well, with Joey, Ralph, Bob Hessen, and perhaps one or two others. I think it was my turn uh, to speak practically as soon as everyone had settled into his seat. I turned to Murray, and the first thing I said was that I still wanted to be friends with him, but that I thought he was in the wrong and that he should have given credit to Ayn and Barbara. It's entirely possible that I described what he had done as plagiarism. Murray's response was simply an angry dismissal out Reisman. I then immediately left his apartment. Bob Hessen said he agreed with me and left with me. That was the end of my friendship with Murray. Despite several efforts, even one on the part of Mises, it could never be repaired. One failure, I'm sure, was my fault. After reestablishing very limited contact, Murray and I agreed sometime in 1983 that 25 years was long enough for a feud. Things even got so far as my submitting an article to the Review of Austrian Economics, of which he was then the editor. In total disregard of diplomacy, the topic I chose for my article was none other than the leading point of contention between us in economic theory. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, whether the rate of profit had to fall to make possible capital accumulation. He rejected the article. And then after that, he rejected another article that Walter Block had gone out of his way to invite me to submit, and which Walter at the time told me he would have published if it had been up to him. My rupture with Murray was a major personal tragedy for me. I lost his friendship, that of his wife, that of my dear old friend and comrade Ralph Rako, and that of Ronald Hamaway. The camaraderie of these four was irreplaceable. As I look back, however, I have to say that it is probably the case that a rupture of some kind was inevitable, if not over the issue of crediting Ayn Rand and Barbara Brandon, then over something else in connection with Ayn Rand. The next something else would probably have been anarcho-capitalism and the idea of competing governments. Beyond that might have been praxeology, an issue over which I temporarily broke with Ayn Rand. I was not thrown out, but walked out. But we are already well beyond our allotted time, and so these must be matters for another day. Perhaps if I am invited back here again next year, I will go into them then, along with many more remembrances of Mises and Ayn Rand that I have. We have ended in 1958. I knew Mises until his death in 1973. I knew Ayn Rand until her death in 1982. So there's a considerable amount that remains. In closing, I'd like to say that I think I've been incredibly fortunate to have known personally and to have personally learned from Ayn Rand and Ludwig von Mises, whom I consider to be the two greatest intellects of the 20th century. I was also fortunate to have known and been close personal friends with Murray Rothbard for about five years and to have had the comradeship of Ralph Rako as well when I was in my youth. And I'd like to add one other name to my account of great good fortune, that of Henry Hazlitt, whom I also knew and for whom I have always had the greatest admiration and who was extremely kind to me. When I look back, I have to say that insofar as they rest on the people I have known, the peaks in my life have been very, very high indeed. I've been truly able to sit across the table and to walk and talk and even dare to argue with giants. Thank you very much. <laughs>